Hi, I'm Justin Crow. I'm the founder and CEO of Parting Stone. The idea for Parting Stone uh, originally came about in 2014 when my grandfather died. This is the first time I had, um, this first major loss in my life, first time I had helped plan a funeral or plan the death with my family. And um, I was asking my friends and family at that time about their experience with loss. And I kept hearing stories about the remains being in closets and basements and garages. And um, it was at that time that I wondered, did we have to be receiving ashes after cremation? And could we invent a new form of remains that was more comfortable? Yeah. <laughs> My grandfather died in 2014. I knew I wanted to create a solution for a more comforting form of remains. Um, I experimented with jewelry. I experimented like cremation, like cremation jewelry. I experimented with cremation uh, glazing pottery with ashes. Um, and all of these things were fine and they were keepsakes. They were helpful for some people, but they didn't really solve the problem because they just required a small amount of ash. And what I recognize is the real challenge was that even after we get these meaningful keepsakes, we still had nine cups of ash left over and they were still ending up in closets. And so that was this moment where I wondered, um, could we just solve this problem with a new form of remains? When was the light bulb moment when you were like, we got it? Oh man, the light bulb moment. There's been so many epiphany moments over the last few years, but um, I think there was a moment when we were working with Los Alamos National Laboratory scientists who helped us develop this technology to solidify um, full amounts of remains. And we, had, we were doing hundreds of material tests and they were uh, kind of just like melting down <laughs> into like puddles. And uh, there was one test that came out solid. And it was this really ugly, like, we, I call it, it was like a lumpy potato. Uh, but I remember, I was, and I was like, oh man, like, this is, this is going to change everything. And I remember taking my lumpy potato and I drove over to the funeral home as fast as I could to like show them, like, I solidified human remains. And they were all like, I don't understand what you're doing here. <laughs> Um, that was a really good moment. <laughs> yeah, so we went from this, we went from the lumpy potato and started to experiment with how do we, um, so that was like, answer this question, could we solidify remains? Yes or no? And the answer was yes. And the next question was, um, could we do it in a way that was beautiful and nice to touch and hold and nice to look at? Um, and, and also, what experience did a family want with the remains? Did they want tiny little pebbles? Did they want cubes, like 60 cubes? <laughs> did they want, you know? And so the second question was more of a user experience question. Um, and we eventually landed on, we tried all kinds of things. We actually originally started with um, tiny little pebbles. And so I had these little jars of pebbles um, that seemed like closer to ash. And so it seemed like maybe that would be an easier conceptual jump. Um, but I remember taking these little jars of pebbles to a funeral conference and I was like, we invented this new form of remains. And I, I remember leaving with like dozens of jokes about breath mints. And I was like, we cannot, this is not the right design. <laughs> um, and so we had eventually ended with, um, you know, a palm sized stone. We found people, families really like to do this, a natural reaction. We, we often see like families do this with the remains and uh, this, this size and this shape and this form um, being, ended up being both really, I mean, good design is oftentimes invisible and you don't look at this and think like, wow, what a really well-designed form of remains. You just experience it. And um, that's what we were trying to accomplish. And I, and I think we have. So talking about doing all these trial runs, where are you getting these cremated remains for trials? <laughs> like, what is going on? Oh, man. So uh, early on, that was a really big challenge. Because um, I'm, you know, and I think being an artist actually helped. Because it's like, 
any any old person walks into a funeral home and says like you're trying to turn ashes into stones they'd be like no 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 yeah. no, no, no but like as an artist I get this weird like pass for doing weird things mm -hmm. and so um I remember going into the, my, the funeral home to to do because I needed some material to eventually develop this technology and it, it was hard to get and I said want to invent this new form of remains, need some material for testing. And they were like, no, there's no way we can do this. And literally the next day I get a call from a hotel in Santa Fe and like this frantic voicemail. And it was like, Hey, I just talked to the funeral home and they told me to call you. And we have these cremated remains that we found in the back of a drawer and we don't know how long they've been there. We found them in a room and we really want to get rid of them and they're human remains and the funeral home won't take them. And I called them up and I was like, I'll be there in 10 minutes. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that's random. Yeah, and I showed up and they were like so excited to give me these remains. And those were the first remains uh, that we got to do our initial testing on. You're like, this is kismic, okay. Yeah, it was, it was a, a wild experience. <laughs> so what is your history? What is your like, background you said artist re i mean you it's mm -hmm. not like you had worked in a funeral home and this was right. something you're encountering and trying to develop so what is your right so my background um is mixed with business and creativity from early on so i remember in second grade i was illustrating name tags and selling them <laughs> to my class for 50 cents each or 10 bucks yeah. you know and um that kind of art and business or creativity and business continued throughout my life. And um, I ultimately went to art school, um, which was very much purely art and very much almost rejected the, the business side of things. Um, graduated from art school, um, started a couple small businesses, doing some experimenting, still doing some art projects, and eventually led to this, which kind of incorporated my knowledge of ceramics and material science um, and creativity and business. Um, yeah. Now, a lot of people talking about artistry, so when you get cremated remains, you put them in an urn, unseen, mm -hmm. sitting on the shelf, even if yep. they're in a pretty urn on the mantle, which is where they all end up, on the mantle yeah. or in the closet in the temporary yeah. box. But this really... Like, this is your grandpa. Mm -hmm. You can set him out, and he is the art. Uh huh. Can see him, can see the person. It is a whole new way to view taking right. home your loved one, not just the stone, but how they can be displayed. What other vision do you have for what you could do with yeah. these? Yeah, great question. So, this was a super interesting part of developing a new form of remains that we didn't expect. Um, when we introduce solidified remains, they're nice to look at, they're nice to touch, they're nice to hold, they're nice to carry, which is none of those things are good with cremated remains. Right. And we started getting all these letters from families describing all of these amazing things they're doing with them. And one thing we noticed is families kept saying, thank you for the solidified remains. We went out and purchased the perfect glass container to keep them in. <laughs> and I realized that by inventing a new form of remains, we may have catalyzed a new merchandise market in death care for container glass containers. There are no glass containers in death care. Nobody wants to look at the ashes. Right. And all of a sudden, they do want to look at the remains, which I think is really interesting. And so we're actually working um, with some designers right now on um, experimenting with some different styles of containers that families can use. Um, some of them display like this. Some of them are more like bowls, which allow you to like pick them up when you want to. And we've had families get little bowls for each room of their house, um, little sharing boxes because you want to share them. Uh, but the, yeah, the merchandise side of this w is really interesting, I think. And people will say, oh, you just want to sell more stuff. But it's once you provide one type of thing, then you almost have to have the accoutrement to go along with that thing. It's just right. We want we want the families to have a a positive experience, and they're going to Hobby Lobby and buying a fishbowl or something. Right. And like we could, we just like we designed an amazing experience of remains. We could design 
merchandise to support whatever they want to do with the remains, whether that's share them, scatter them, right. view them, touch them. Uh, and we, we would like to help design that too. Yeah. Well, I think that with anything in the market, you know, there's um, Eternal Ride that has the cap covers, which I'm sure I'm using all the wrong terminology, for motorcycle mm. that you can put on to put cremated remains in. And mm -hmm. So it's coming up with the things to go along with different avenues. What I keep picturing, so recently cleaning out a storage closet with my boyfriend, he found this little, it was a tobacco carrier, mm. which is about this size, mm -hmm. a little leather pouch you put on your belt that one of these would fit perfectly in to carry yeah. somebody along. And I know really nice. Jeff has yeah. his cat stone, he told us earlier, in a little pouch on his mm -hmm. belt. And all I picture is that tobacco pouch, mm -hmm. which is just this little leather nondescript pouch that you could put a stone in perfectly yeah. to carry your loved one on a trip or around with you every day. Or, yeah. you know, I think some people have that need where, you know what, today's a hard day. Today I miss my mom. Today I want mom just with me. And I can't just take a scoop of her cremated remains, put it in my pocket. Sure, I could wear jewelry piece or something, but tactically, you know, touching her and taking her, this is more hands-on. It's yeah. just more practical when it comes to something like that. And if I lose this, I'm probably gonna find it quicker than I would a little bitty jewelry piece. Yeah. Um, do you see that you as a company would expand out into some of these other things or more so other companies or sub company mm -hmm. or any vision on that? Maybe, you know, we're really focused on making a new form of remains and making this experience as positive as we can for families. It's our 100% focus right now. Nice. Um, and so, Exploring partnerships with designers makes a lot of sense for us right now. Um, that said, maybe we will produce some Parting Stone brand yeah. merchandise in the future. Um, I'm not sure. When running this as a business is, is key. Yeah. And when it comes to death care, we are very much um, chastised for running things, funeral homes, anything death care related, mm -hmm. cemeteries, crematories as a business because yeah. you have to have the revenue coming in to pay your costs to continue to have the lights on. Right. And I know that you have been trying not to charge much yeah. because of wanting to help the consumer, yeah. feeling that desire within you to help others as well, but you had to raise prices. Yeah. And it came along with this place on Shark Tank that and <laughs> happened to all kind of happen at the same time. Did that really have something to do with each other or was that just kind of coincidental? Yeah, you know, as a startup, when I launched Parting Stone, I thought I knew how much it was going to cost and we priced accordingly and we wanted to prove that there, were, there was a market of people who wanted an alternative to cremated remains. And um, we had it priced at one price and uh, it worked and that was great and we we're helping a lot of families but yeah. ultimately we realized that the process is really intensive as you saw today and yeah. um, in order to continue to offer it we realized we needed to raise the prices um, and you know I think some families are still are still going to do it and they are still doing it um, right. but you know it's not for everyone as well. And our goal is to continue to make this more and more accessible. Um, but our number one goal is to make sure we're here in two years to be able to continue to do what we're doing today. Right. Keeping the lights on, yeah. but doing it well. I know that's yeah. been a huge part of being here and talking to everybody is wanting to do this and do this in the best way. Mm -hmm. Not do it so you just have a product or something to meet the need to send to families. It's doing this as a complete solution and doing it well. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, like you've said, some things you have to invest in machinery yeah. to help the process be more mainstream as you increase 
Mm -hmm. your goals and as you increase the influx of cremated remains i know that part of it was um heidi when she was given the tour earlier said yeah this was where we used to hand finish every stone mm -hmm. and now you have almost like a rock polisher kind yeah. of machinery that's doing that which is increasing your yeah. Load and that's only going to be more and more hopefully more efficient process to be able to serve more families and not have it take three months just because of the increased. Yeah. Right now, yeah. what is the next step that you're hoping to achieve with bringing on Shark Tank and bringing on these tried and true investors and business people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. I think. Um, Shark Tank in and of itself, uh, what I'm really excited about is I got to stand on stage and say, we invented a new form of remains. When you choose cremation, you don't have to receive ashes anymore. There's a comforting alternative. That was an amazing opportunity yeah. to educate the country that, that this is an option. Um, and as a small business, we don't, we didn't have $20 million to do a ad campaign to right. reach everyone in the United States. And this was the opportunity to do it. Um, and we work really closely with funeral homes. Mm -hmm. And so what, what our hope is with the shark tank opportunity is that families now know many families now know that this is an option. And so that when they do have to plan a death, they walk into that funeral home. And they can either say, do you offer stones or solidified remains? Or when they see the option of solidified remains, they know what it is. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I hope we can reach more families that way. Yeah, I think I've told you all, like this company feels good in my soul because of what it offers. And I think because in my own way, having my dog and not knowing what the heck to do with those cremated remains, this became the best thing for me. And I think until I, I saw that need, I loved the, what you did, but didn't mm. feel it. And I know that you talking about it, you feel it. This wasn't just a thing you came up with right. for an industry. It's something you came up with because you believed this was good. And did it take much convincing to convince your grandma? Like, Hey grandma, give me grandpa and let me do this. Did it? Um, it didn't. No, I mean, my, my grandpa, um, this grandpa yeah. did, um, he was actually one of the first investors in the company. Aww. He took his pension, some of his pension money oh, and, gosh. you know, put in a little money. Um, he was, you know, my biggest fan. Um, and he died, uh, maybe just about six or seven months after we launched. And so he knew, he knew he was going to be sort of <laughs> Uh, and he, he vocalized that, um, so special. That's yeah. a pretty big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's more confidence than anybody could ever put in <laughs> yeah. you. Like take my body and do For what sure. you need to do. Yeah. Now the culture here at the business is a big deal. Yeah. I think. Yeah. And you can feel that. Um, what was your goal in building a business and taking on employees? Mm -hmm. What was kind of that base goal that you had? Yeah, I remember, so I remember that first year, we maybe had five or six employees. I had a um, funeral home come for a tour and uh, the owner went to lunch after and we got in, he could not wait to ask me. He said, like, how do you do your hiring? And he's like, I have never seen a death industry or death profession company culture like that. Mm -hmm. um, which I took as a huge compliment. And the goal with our company culture is just to feel normal thinking and talking about death and mortality. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're there, a lot of the production staff in particular, they're touching human remains every single day. Mm -hmm. This is, and, and they do it respectfully, but also, you know, we have a light, culture. We joke around, um, uh, but also it kind of balances out the weight of, of confronting death every, every day. Mm -hmm. uh, but ultimately the goal is to just normalize it and have a, um, 
uh, an energized attitude in the in the laboratory and focus on that you know yeah this is this representation of death and mortality but really what this is is this is going to go and be a person's most treasured possession in their entire life and mean something so emotional to them and focusing on that as what this is not as death mm -hmm. uh, i think i think is really important well, I think some of the, the terms as we were walking through, like when Pat put my dog on the shelf, she's like, all right, we'll see you in a little bit. And, away. <laughs> and then Heidi said, you know, if somebody needs to go to the hospital, we, they go to the hospital if they need yeah. to kind of create a better, you know, format for the stone. And um, what is she? Oh, the bath, you know, after they come out of the tumbler, or what is that process? When they're, yeah, the finisher. Their finisher. Yeah. They get to go for a bath. So we give yeah. them a bath and, you know, that's, it is still looking at somebody as they are somebody and not just this material that's coming yeah. through, which I think is hard, even in a funeral home with a full body mm -hmm. to stop and really always reflect and remember that it is a person mm -hmm. and not just this thing that we're taking care of. And I think on this side, you could really get to that because mm -hmm. they, there is no face, there right. is no identity. Abstract. It's super abstract but yet the way I have overheard, and I don't just think it's happening because I'm here or because other people, <laughs> that it is really ingrained in everybody that's here and that they feel meaning in what they're doing. Yeah. I could just be deciphering wrong, but I really no, right. do feel it being here. Yeah, and one thing that I think that we do here that's really unique, um, that goes a long way, is when remains go back to families, um, we have a little le a blank letter mm -hmm. in the box. And on the outside it says, um, if you have a few minutes, please write us and tell us about your experience. The lab technician that worked on your order is blank. And we write the name of the technician that worked mm -hmm. on the order. And the family has the opportunity to write to us. Mm -hmm. And those letters get delivered directly to the staff member um, that worked on the order. And they get to open that letter and they get to read that family's experience and it's very connected and i think those i get them too you know and those have a big impact yeah. on me um and we've received probably over 400 of those letters in the last few years which has really been amazing do people ever send you photos yes. of their loved one yeah. like this is who you were handling and this yep. is who you were molding and yep yeah and it's been interesting too to like Sometimes, sometimes it's a little too much for, for some people. Some people have opted out of letters because they're very sensitive and they're like, I appreciate this, but it's really sad sometimes. And yeah. seeing those images sometimes can, can be, I don't know, there's a, there's a happy medium of like knowing you're impacting somebody, but maybe not internalizing that and like taking that home. Um, but yeah. Yeah, that's that. I can see how that's when you distance yourself, it's a little easier to do the work you're doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when it becomes a little more human or pet, you yeah. know, when yeah. you see those images, that gets a little more emotional and it's easier not to be connected to the emotion of it mm -hmm. sometimes. Yeah, and, and going back to, to the kind of the vernacular and the attitude that you've seen and the, you know, treating them with care, like they are people, mm -hmm. um, and may, and, you know, being a little cute maybe in the, in the terminology and like all that is, is good. And also we have this, we have a chain of custody process and technology that is really, really good. Yeah. And I think we focused a lot on developing that chain of custody. So we know where everybody is at all times. Um, decedents down to the shelf that they're on. Um, and I think part of what allows us to kind of focus on the, the people is that that t chain of custody technology is super streamlined and integrated. It's hopefully invisible. It's a really, it's just a barcode scan. Boop. Yeah. You can go back and focus on what you're doing. Um, and so like that balance, I think, is really important. How often do people ask you to be able to track 
I know that's something mm -hmm. people can request. How often? Yeah. So um, to be honest, not very often. Yeah. <laughs> and the reason is we've put a lot of work into making sure the family tr a trusts what we're doing and b is actually informed at every step. And as long as we succeed at those two things, we don't often get asked for additional information. But when we do, we print out a full chain of custody report with, I believe, 24 transfer points throughout the six week process that tells them exactly when their loved one entered our care. Um, and if they need further information, we have like 15 cameras yeah. throughout and they point at the paperwork and at the remains so we can actually screenshot on the cameras every time the decedent moves uh, if that needs to be supported which that doesn't really happen but yeah. it's there as a backup well that's we got we took a break in the middle of filming earlier and came back and i was facetiming my daughter and i said ralphie's here do you want to go see where he's at and I went to go see him on the shelf and I was like, he's already gone off the shelf. He's on his way and into the process. And I want to kind of like peek and follow. But then, like you said, you have to just step back and trust the process. And I think it's that way with the funeral home, with anything mm -hmm. like if we did that at a funeral home, like, OK, they're, we, we're intaking the deceased. They're placed in a cooler. They're going up to the be embalmed. They're going to the dressing. Mm -hmm. If we did that along the process, people would get so inundated with yeah that that maybe it's not healthy maybe it is but it is also good to just you've chosen something to trust in who you're placing the deceased with yeah until they're back with you so there's i, I see pros and cons a balance. On, on both sides but you have to i think release control at some point during the whole process as well yeah, I agree. I mean, starting the company, our kind of philosophy was if somebody wants to know exactly where their pizza is when it's on the way to them, then they probably want to know where their mom is yes. too. Um, but yeah, we have, like I said, like 24 transfer points and we send notifications at five of those, which you'll receive. Nice. So you'll yeah, I got that. my first email right away when we, you know, <laughs> and took him. So that was kind of cool. So I'll have to screenshot all those to share, to sh just show what they're like. What is one thing if you leave people with one thought on parting mm. stone, what would that be? Mm. Success or failure, whatever this company is two years from now, if it's big or if it has closed, mm -hmm. what do you want it to have achieved in the time it was here? Yeah, I just want to reach, I want more families to have the experience that I'm having, you know, with my grandfather. Um, And just to be able to hold him again, to be able to leave a part of his remains in the Santa Fe River, to be able to travel with him, to be able to take him on Shark Tank. Yeah. You know, um, these aren't things that are comfortable to do with ashes. And it's had a big impact on me. We've worked with over 5,000 families. Um, and we've received letters, like I said, from about 400 of them talking about all these experiences. And I want people to continue to have those experiences. And if we can continue to reach more people to have positive experiences, um, that is that is my goal. Awesome. Thank you guys for joining us. If you wanna know more, go to partingstone.com, correct? Correct, partingstone.com. Find out more. Uh, if you'd like to have your loved one turn into stone rather than having that box of cremated remains up in the closet or on the mantle go to partingstone.com or ask your local funeral home how they can assist you in doing this thank you thanks